kick things off, we're delighted to have as our day one keynote speaker, Neil Mohan. Neil is the Chief Product Officer at YouTube and a Senior Vice President at Google. He is responsible for YouTube products and user experience on all platforms and devices globally. This includes YouTube's core mobile applications, Creator Studio for content producers, emerging technologies like VR, vertical experiences such as YouTube Kids and Music, and YouTube subscription service, YouTube Red. Previously, Neil was Senior Vice President of Display and Video Ads. In this role, he was responsible for the company's advertising offerings on YouTube, the Google Display Network, AdSense, AdMob, and a double-click family of programmatic ad platform products. He is focused on growing the overall digital media industry by building innovative solutions for millions of Google's advertising and media partners around the world. Neil, please join us. Thanks, Will. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here in Las Vegas today. Uh, this is my first time at NAB, and as uh, Will just mentioned, as, and perhaps some of you know, I spent most of my career uh, leading Google's display and video advertising business. And in that role, I worked very closely with several others to build out the revenue monetization uh, at, uh, at YouTube. And as a result of building out that revenue monetization, I got to see the evolution of that YouTube platform up close and personal over uh, many years. About five months ago, uh, I went all in at YouTube and took over as the Chief Product Officer. And now that I've settled into that role, what I'd love to do today is offer a few thoughts uh, on uh, YouTube's trajectory and also on how product and content are going to come together uh, as distribution shifts to digital. By the way, the mic's going in and out. Can you guys hear me in the back? No, okay. Can you guys hear me now in the back? Yeah. All right, great. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, I took over as uh, the Chief Product Officer at YouTube about uh, five months ago, and I've been settling in. And now that I've settled in, I'd love to offer some thoughts on where YouTube is headed, and perhaps most importantly for this audience, kind of how I see consumer products and content come together in this new age of digital uh, distribution that's so important to all of us. If I had to sum up YouTube's approach for the past 10 years, it was all about bigger, better, and faster. Our goal was to reach as many users as possible, offer them a very high fidelity product, and to stream that video content as fast as we knew how to. So first, let me talk about bigger. Today, YouTube reaches over a billion users uh, worldwide in the course of a single month. We're in 88 countries and in 76 different languages. We're continuing to see, and what's really amazing about that is we're continuing to see growth in every single region across the world. Not just in terms of daily active viewers, but also in the amount of video that those viewers are consuming on YouTube every single day. Next, let me talk about better. For a few years early on, we all knew YouTube as the place where we all, as amateurs, would go and upload video. Uh, and that video sometimes would be grainy, sometimes it would be low definition. But as bro broadband speeds improved dramatically, and as cameras on the web and on phones got better, we started to support HD. Today, as many of you know, we support 4K, but we also support 8K and 60 frames a second. In fact, over a million videos on the YouTube platform today are available in 4K. And that includes all of the YouTube original content that we've produced that's exclusively available to our YouTube Red subscribers. Finally, faster. We've cut buffering by more than 30%, giving back millions of hours a day to our users uh, every single day. But we've also worked to provide better access in our fastest growing emerging markets. These are markets like India, Indonesia, and most of Latin America. Slow speeds and high data costs limit how people in those markets can enjoy YouTube today. So we're launching video data plans with our mobile carrier partners in these markets to make the experience better for our customers. We're also working with partners 
in those markets to allow offline access so that people can download videos on their Wi-Fi or in the middle of the night when data rates might be lower or when bandwidth speeds might be better and then enjoy those videos whenever they have time. Bigger, better, and faster is still really core to who we are and what we want to be. So we're continuing to launch in new markets all the time. For example, in the last few weeks we launched in places like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Nepal, bringing YouTube to another 250 million viewers uh, in total. In addition to supporting 4K and 8K, we announced right here in Las Vegas at CES support for HDR video as well. And we're continuing to explore new ways of delivering video, new video data plans in some of our most engaged emerging markets. But as YouTube has journeyed from a website that you would primarily access on your desktop to an app that's now accessed on mobile, on your tablets, on your living room screens, and now increasingly with virtual reality headsets, we've, it's forced us to rethink our entire product strategy and how we deliver experiences to our consumers. Today, viewing content, first of all, is inherently more personal. No longer do you have to share what you're watching with your family or your siblings. You can watch whatever you want to watch virtually whenever you want to watch it. It also has the potential to be a lot more interactive, especially as we move from keyboards to touch screens, motion recognition, and voice control. And because video content consumption is a lot more personal and interactive, it means that interruptions carry a very different weight today. A 30 second commercial during a show on television is expected. On your phone, that can be annoying. And if it happens while you're enjoying content with a virtual reality headset on, it can actually make you throw up. So, uh, so in addition to bigger, better, and faster, we're now focused on being smarter, immersive, and seamless. Let me talk about all three of these. So first of all, what do I mean by being smarter? Smarter means better organized, with better discovery and recommendations for consumers. There are some content experiences on YouTube where our enormous library uh, can actually get in the way of what you want to quickly see or listen to on the platform. And if any of you have children, which I'm sure many of you do, uh, you probably live this uh, example every single day. When you hand your phone or your tablet to your kid, you want to make sure that the videos they're watching are the ones that they should be watching. This is something that we weighed incredibly carefully before we launched a YouTube Kids standalone app last year. And I'm happy to report that ever since launching, we've seen enormous uptake in that app, to the point where it's now the hot, most downloaded kids app on iOS, with a 4.5 uh, star rating across the board. Music is another example. Today, as many of you know, YouTube is one of the primary destinations where you go to consume music online. And the reason, of course, is because of our incredibly large and diverse uh, 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 catalog of music content. But sometimes, that can be a little bit uh, confusing if you as a listener don't know if you're listening to the original uh, a cover copy or an acoustic version of a particular song. So this is something that we thought a lot about before we launched the music app and we spent an incredible amount of time labeling and categorizing all of that music content to create a better experience for our users who use the music app. Smarter doesn't just mean curation, however, though. It means smarter UIs, and it means better features. For example, like the timer on the YouTube Kids app, or artist-based stations in the music app. We've also used the power of algorithms to improve recommendations and discovery right on the main YouTube experience. In the last year, we're seeing significant boosts in the amount of videos people watch based on these algorithmic recommendations. For example, two of the places that drive the most amount of watch time on the YouTube platform are the recommended videos and the videos that we feature on the home page itself, all of which are algorithmically generated. So that's smarter. Now let me talk about immersive. Immersive video is an area that's on everybody's mind. We've seen an explosion of interest over the last few months in, in things like 360 degree video and VR. As many of you know, YouTube launched support for 360 degree video last year. And ever since we've launched it, we've seen artists and musicians and athletes and brands do really amazing things with this technology. There's a new Broadway show, for example, 
uh, based on Jack Black's film, School of Rock. And they filmed a 360 degree video of a performance to increase awareness about the show. And that video led to a nearly 3x spike in the amount of traffic to their ticketing website. And it made, turned the show into a smash hit. That show generates over a million dollars a week uh, in gross revenue. And now you won't just be able to see that video in 360 degrees, you'll actually be able to hear it. Today, we're launching spatial audio, which lets you sense the direction and distance of a sound. So if you're hearing something on your left side, uh, on the left side, you should be able to hear it uh, louder in your left ear. And for, some, for something like a music concert that you're watching at 360 degrees, sound will now rever reverberate all around you. Just plug in your headphones into your Android phone and play a 360 degree video on YouTube and you'll, you can see exactly what it's like. But spatial audio isn't the only thing that we're taking a step forward on today. I'm happy to announce that as of today, you'll be able to live stream content on YouTube in 360 degrees. The first time this technology has been available at scale. And to kick things off, we partnered with The Verge to launch the first 360 live stream this coming Wednesday directly from our YouTube space in LA. You know, we've all had that experience of wishing that we could go to the concert or that sporting event, and yes, even that convention. And now with 360 live streaming, we're getting you one step closer to actually being there. And for all of you that don't have your wristbands to Coachella this coming weekend, we're gonna make available that concert in 360 degrees live streaming for the first time ever. So we're all really excited about 360 live streaming, but we're also deeply focused on things like VR and headset viewing too. YouTube is already the world's largest library of virtual reality content because literally every single video available on the platform can be watched in VR mode using Google Cardboard. And we've seen enormous growth here. Just in the last month, we've seen VR playbacks and watch time grow by four to 500 percent. We're continuing to invest in better camera technology, better video processing, and content partnerships to bring more of these truly enriched, immersive experiences to all of our YouTube, uh, YouTube users across the world. So stay tuned for what we have planned here. The final thing I want to talk about is seamless. As I mentioned before, a cross-screen or immersive experience makes video viewing much more personal. And as a result, it makes interruptions that much more jarring. This is something that I, I learned firsthand running the ads businesses uh, at, at Google, where we saw that if the ad was in context and native feeling, users responded to it much better. And it's something that we've seen on the YouTube platform as well. Historically, we've tried to maintain generally lower ad loads on the platform. And as you know, most of the ads that you see on YouTube are skippable. And we think that this is a great experience, not just for our users, but for our advertisers as well. And for those fans that don't want, don't, really don't want any interruptions at all, even the slightest, we have a new subscription service called YouTube Red. YouTube Red view viewers also will have access to original content, original series, original films, featuring YouTube stars. We've launched six of these titles already, featuring stars such as PewDiePie, Prank Academy, and others, and we have a whole slate of original content that we're gonna be bringing out over the course of the next few months. YouTube Red is relatively new, but we're really happy with how it's going, and as we continue to increase our investment in producing original content, we think it's gonna be a thriving part of our overall business. So there you have it. Smarter, immersive, seamless. Those are the things that we're hard at work at uh, at YouTube every single day. You know, I'm here at NEB today primarily to meet many of you and to learn, but to the extent that I have any advice to offer, I would say that we all of them need to take those three principles uh, to heart as we think about how our content is distributed and consumed in today's digital cross-screen age. If your mobile app is just a viewer, for example, chances are that consumers are going to consume content somewhere else. It can't just be your TV channel uh, on your phone. And the same goes for interactivity. Users increasingly expect it and are engaging with content that delivers it every single day. Immersive content needs to be something that we're all thinking about constantly. 
And finally, a more seamless experience. Over the past year, we've seen major networks like Vice and Turner experience, uh, experiment with lower ad loads and more native feeling advertising uh, on, their, on their channels. And I think this is a, a crucial area for all of us to experiment in. And the fundamental reason is because all of our users are asking for it. So thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'd like to invite Will Richmond back up on stage so that we can continue this conversation. So thank you. Thank you very much. And we will also be inducting the newest member of the NAB Broadcasting Hall of Fame, uh, one of the most talented minds in television and the creator of my show, Chuck Lorre. Um, I, I, I wonder take a moment here, actually, uh, to, uh, to welcome Chuck, and, and uh, just to relate it, that uh, for the many years that I've worked with Chuck, uh, people have always asked me, how does he do this? Where does this come from? You know, what, that, that he's got this incredible gift that has led to this in, in amazing body of work uh, that has spanned all these years and has generated billions of dollars in revenue. And, and literally the Walk of Fame on Hollywood Boulevard has a constellation of stars that, were, that the actors have from characters that Chuck created. How, where does that come from? And uh, honestly, uh, I attribute it to a, uh, a discount colonoscopy he received when he was a young man. Uh, uh, allow me to explain. Uh, when he first came to California, uh, he didn't want to be a writer. He wanted to be a musician. Uh, in fact, he didn't like television because they kept canceling shows that he loved. So, uh, but then uh, uh, good fortune struck and uh, he developed ulcerative colitis. So, whew, thank goodness for us because uh, he had no insurance as a musician. So uh, he had to uh, sort of find a way to get the colonoscopy that he needed. Uh, what he ended up with was a bunch of pre-med students who offered to do it uh, for cheap. Uh, if he allowed uh, many, many people to watch it, uh, and if he did it without anesthesia. Uh, so, now, as a lot of people argue that that is actually perfect training uh, for dealing with the likes of uh, Roseanne Barr, Fred Butler, Sybil Shepard, and Charlie Sheen. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, the, uh, the, but what happened was, that uh, after this particular experience, uh, that is what caused him to decide to become a comedy writer because they have insurance. Uh, I also want to recognize my beautiful wife who's sitting right there with Chuck, uh, Lisa Joyner. She's here today. She is uh, proud to have worked in the broadcasting business for most of her life. Uh, and I just did that because I can, because I'm the MC. So we have a great program ahead, uh, and here to get things started is the NAB's Executive Vice President of Television and President of the NAB Education Foundation, Marcellus Alexander. Bring the action. Thank you, John. We are absolutely thrilled to have you here to join us today. Anytime we can have an actor who's an Emmy Award-winning actor, MC our luncheon, it's a very good thing. Today we're here to celebrate television and the incredible role it plays in our lives as individuals, as families, and as citizens. Television informs us and keeps us safe through local news and emergency updates. It unites us during times of joy and of sorrow and entertains us with programs that have us feel a range of emotions. It provides critical information and perspective on issues that shape our world, especially during election years. Whether it's experiencing live performances of iconic musicals, watching socially awkward geniuses move through life, or exploring complex and hilarious relationships between spouses, siblings, parents, children, television entertains and enriches our lives. And it's people like all of you who make it possible. I'd like to take a moment to recognize some of the talented leaders who are with us today. We welcome the Network Affiliate Board Chairs, 
We're fortunate to have representatives from all of the network affiliates with us today. If you'll please stand and be recognized. I also want to acknowledge the leaders of other broadcast industry associations who are here today, including, and stick with me through these acronyms, TVB, BEA, BFM, IRTS, and the Broadcasters Foundation. If you'll all please stand as well. And finally, I would like to welcome the members of Kiki Palmer's family who are with her today. We're joined by her very proud parents, Mr. and Mrs. Palmer, as well as her young Again, thank you all for being here. Television success for more than two decades, the NAB Education Foundation has been preparing leaders at every level of broadcasting by offering programs targeted to entry-level positions through station ownership. NABEF's programs reinforce the future of broadcasting through a commitment to education and advancing the diversity and community service, all of those efforts of our industry. I'm proud to be a part of this impactful organization. Let's take a look at this video. Education Foundation offers leadership and management programs catering to every career level. Our unique initiatives can serve as your steps to success. Talitha Haley kickstarted her career at the Media Sales Institute. By the way, that best year title each year is very hard fought after. It's a congratulations that you got it this year. We also want to recognize the program's tireless leader, Diane Sitter, for the many hours she dedicates to ensuring that the program and its participants succeed. Diane, if you would stand and accept our appreciation. Working in a business that entertains, inspires, and informs millions of people every day is an honor. And it's all thanks to your support and your many contributions. So thank you. Your presence here at the NAB Show is one way that you demonstrate with your commitment, demonstrate with your commitment to ensuring television's continued success. Now, please welcome a gentleman with whom I have the pleasure of working very closely. He is the NAB Television Board Chair and the EW Scripps Company Senior Vice President of Broadcast, Brian Law. Thanks, Marcellus. As we all know, no other medium captures the emotions of our lives as powerfully as television. We saw this firsthand in our coverage of riots in Baltimore and the terrorist attacks in San Bernardino, and now in this year's national elections. Our stations tell important stories that impact our viewers. The nation counts on our coverage, whether broadcast over the air, delivered through cable boxes or computers, or sent right to their phones. In today's media climate, America needs our veteran reporters, our venerable brands, and our cutting edge technology more than ever. And speaking of technology, the television business continues to grow and to thrive as it invests in new ways of reaching audiences. As an industry, we're developing and implementing all kinds of new technologies that will deliver more news, more information, more entertainment to our audiences, helping them connect with us on many media platforms and strengthening the future of broadcasting. 
Meanwhile, as we're growing our businesses and serving our communities, the National Association of Broadcasters continues to fight on our behalf for legislative and regulatory policies that support our ability to innovate and keep our community safe, informed, and entertained. Of course, many of our politicians in Washington are out campaigning this year, and as we know, that's a good thing for us. But while it may be tougher to get them to pay attention to issues that impact broadcasting, NAB will continue to work to educate them about the value of broadcasting and lay the groundwork for the next Congress and new administration. And on that note, I'd like to touch for a moment on a few priority issues that can impact our future, the spectrum auction, retransmission consent, and our next generation television transmission standard. Let's start with the spectrum auction. NAB is committed to working with Congress and the FCC to promote a successful auction. Our eyes are focused on perhaps the most challenging phase of the auction, that being relocating or repacking likely a majority of remaining broadcasters to new frequencies in the television band once the auction concludes. The FCC is requiring broadcasters complete these moves within only 39 months, but we remain concerned that the process could take much longer. We need to ensure that safeguards are in place, that no broadcaster is forced off the air if it is unable to meet the deadline or the circumstances outside of its own control. Congress has allocated one blessed to work in this dynamic industry, which has been entertaining and informing generations of Americans for nearly a century. I would venture to say that a new age, of, a new golden age of television is dawning. As you will see here this week at the ATSC Consumer Experience, which is co-sponsored by the NAB, the Consumer Technology Association, and the Advanced Television Systems Committee, ATSC 3.0 Next Generation Television is real, and it's coming soon to your living room. In addition to robust transmission to mobile and fixed devices, improved indoor reception, immersive and personalized audio, interactive advertising, advanced emergency alerting, and new levels of flexibility, interoperability, and extensibility, the new internet protocol-based standard will enable terrestrial broadcasts of 4K and HDR programming for the first time. With that in mind, I'm excited to announce that today's NAB Television Luncheon Grand Prize is a new 4K Ultra HD OLED TV trumpeted by industry pundits as the best TV ever. This stunning 65-inch model combines the intense detail of 4K UHD and the superior contrast that only OLED provides for the ultimate in picture quality and HDR capability. It delivers breathtaking images with perfect wax and incredible color. Now I'd like to invite John Cryer to, to draw a lucky winner of this incredible new LG OLED 4K TV worth six thousand dollars. Yes, I'm just here to look pretty. That's what I'm here for. Drum roll, please. Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm going deep. I'm going deep. Put it in first, third in luck. No. Bang out. The winner is Maria Larocque. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you, Maria. I'll try to make some tea.
take a show so you can look at all of this action. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, congratulations. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks again to John and LG Electronics. This is quite something. There's a couple of tables up front with congressional staffers. I need to thank all you people for... <laughs> I lost my I want to thank the National Association of Broadcasters. The Hall of Fame. It's, uh, it's really something. I don't want to take anything away from it, but I have to imagine being inducted into anybody's Hall of Fame is a thrilling experience. I mean, think about it. The asshole Hall of Fame is still a Hall of Fame. <laughs> Thank God. Could have gone either way. Anyway. Probably has marble pillars and dramatic lighting. And who knows if you're inducted, your picture might hang on a wall right next to Donald. <laughs> Duck. <laughs> as far as I understand it, the NAB represents companies that produce and distribute free TV and radio which means you are all to be congratulated for your inner strength and emotional composure. Given that the media world has suddenly been engulfed by on-demand streaming services, premium channels, internet channels, YouTube channels, podcasts, satellite, and internet radio, it would not have been surprising to come here today to find a room filled with crying, screaming, vomiting people. <laughs> but no, you're unruffled. Like dinosaurs happily munching on a treetop. <laughs> Likely unaware of the giant asteroid plummeting to Earth. Good for you. I actually pitched the idea of doing a eulogy for broadcast television. I was advised against it. Um, I didn't come here to bite the hand that feeds me. Broadcast television has allowed me to do what I love, which is to make people laugh. It has been a true blessing in my life. Even if network censors, nervous advertisers, and the FCC routinely suck all the joy out of it. <laughs> Even if the constant stress and anxiety of 60 hour weeks has caused me to suffer from chronic bronchitis, migraines, and irritable bowel syndrome. Even if a few actors and actresses occasionally behaved. Well, let me, let me be delicate here. Let's say inappropriately. It was still a wonderful, wonderful journey. When I hear people laughing for a brief moment, I feel like I have the power to make a difference in this world. Even though I know that all the real power is held by less moodness. <laughs> I'll maybe bite the hand a little bit. I have no doubt that without sitcoms right now, I'm in Boca Raton wearing a shitty tuxedo, playing guitar, and singing Who Let the Dogs Out of the Schneiderman Bar Mitzvah. <laughs> Five hours, 80 bucks, and praying for an open bar. I think, like many of you, I, I grew up watching a handful of channels on a tiny black and white set. Enthralled by the stories I was told, I had no idea that someday I'd have a chance to tell a few stories myself. And when I finally did get that chance, I believe I did one thing right. I decided that every second of air time I was given was a potential opportunity to entertain millions of people, which to me meant that every second was precious, which is why in every episode of my shows, from the opening credit theme songs through every story, every line of dialogue, dialogue, every joke, even the vanity cards, I tried to use those seconds to entertain. So, is about what I've been doing for the last 30 years. And while this honor seems to mark the end of my career, <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm just now starting to feel like I'm getting the hang of it. And, uh, in case you're wondering, there actually is an asshole hall of fame. It's in Burbank, California, and I have my own parking space there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, uh, once again, uh, our congratulations to Kiki Palmer, a uh, Kiki Palmer's family, Chuck Lorre, Chuck Lorre's family. Hey, so what's up? Uh, <laughs> and uh, we just want to congratulate Chuck Lorre uh, for his induction into the NAB Broadcasting Hall of Fame. Thank you for joining us, and enjoy the rest of the show. Good night.